Isn't everyone supposed to be home watching the Super Bowl? Well, a lot of uh, congregations, even in the Lord's Church, have, will change their times of services in order to accommodate people so that they can watch the Super Bowl. Instead of trying to get people to put the Lord first in their life and then work those type of things around the Lord instead of making the Lord take a back seat and a lower priority in their life than uh, sporting events or whatever you might have. And sadly, there's some even supposedly conservative congregations who have and preachers who have advocated go ahead and change the time services to accommodate things like the Super Bowl or other events and so it's is it any wonder that we see the church continuing to compromise in various areas and no longer being that distinctive light in a world of darkness <clears throat> And that brings us kind of to our subject tonight that we are going to be continuing in our study, how that Christ confronts religious traditions. And we noted that tradition, the word very simply means that which has been handed down. The who handed it down or what has been handed down is not inherent in the term though. And thus... Last week, we centered upon the idea that there are traditions from God, handed down by God. These are things that are mandatory that we must do in order to be pleasing to God. Uh, we would see in uh, passages uh, such as 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter and verse 2 in that, that regard, that we are to keep the King James has the ordinances, while the New King James and the American Standard has traditions, as I delivered unto them, unto you, Paul says. Now here's Paul delivering something, and what he delivered was the Word of God. And what, then we see it used in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, and 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6 as well, that they were to stand fast and hold the traditions that they had been taught whether by word or by epistle. And then in relationship to the withdrawing of fellowship from those who walk disorderly and walk not after the tradition which he received of us. And so here are those times in which that word tradition is used in reference to that which God has handed down. But then, of course, there's traditions of man as well, or from man. And uh, thus, they are only authorized by man. But when we look at traditions of man, or from man, there's two categories of traditions that we need to deal with in relationship to traditions from man. The first of those is those traditions that are not authorized by God. God did not authorize them. During Paul's day, he speaks of the Gentile world in uh, Romans, the first chapter, starting with verse 19 and going through verse 32, and we won't read the section. But he lists in all of that how that they had forsaken God and thus God gave them up to unclean lust to do the things which are not convenient. They had glorified the creation over the creator. And then he lists, uh, there's a long list of things which they were doing that had been handed down from one generation to another generation that were things that were sinful. And verse 18 of Romans 1 says that the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. And the children of disobedience, he's listing there, of oh, those things that he discusses in verses 19 through 32. Now, wrath of God is coming upon them. Why? Because these are traditions of men, yes. 
but they're traditions of men that God did not authorize. They had no right to be doing those things because God did not authorize man to do those things. And because God didn't authorize them, they're sinful. And Paul wrote to the Corinthian brethren in 1 Corinthians 6 chapter. We come to verse 9 and verse 10, and Paul writes, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Each one of these things that Paul is enlisting here tradition of man. Those things that have been handed down from one generation to another generation to another generation and thus the Corinthians were engaged in those activities. Why? Because they had been handed down from one generation to another generation but they were from man, not from God. But these were actions that were handed down from man that God did not authorize. In becoming a Christian now, they had to put away these traditions. Look at the next verse, verse 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of, our Lord Je- of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice, you were that way. You are living according to those traditions of man that were not authorized by God, but you have to put those things away. You had to stop doing those things when you became a Christian. And such, thus, you were that way at one time, but you're no longer that way. Why? Because you become a Christian. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and that would go back to that aspect of being baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins. As you would see that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, 1 John 1 and verse 7. But how do we contact that blood of Christ that washes us? Well, we find Ananias telling Saul, Why tarryest thou, rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. So you're washed. How? When you're baptized, you're washed clean of those sins. You're sanctified. The idea of sanctification is that you have become holy. And we've noted in other lessons how that holy has two applications. It applies to one who is freed from their sin. How do we become freed from our sins? Well, that's that washing that takes place in the act of baptism. But then one who is dedicated and consecrated to God. What has he done? He's put away these traditions of men that he's listed here in verses 9 and 10, and he is now doing what God wants him to do and living the type of life that God wants him to do. And as a result, he is justified. He is in a right relationship with God. While he was doing these things, though, these traditions of men that are not authorized by God, he was not in a right relationship with God. He was not justified. He was under the condemnation of God. And that goes back to what we said in Romans 1 and verse 18. In relationship to the Gentiles, they were under the condemnation. They had the wrath of God coming upon them. Why? Because they were living according to the traditions of men that were not authorized by God. Now, not this week, but Lord willing, next Sunday night, we're going to also notice the aspect of the traditions of men that are authorized by God. But we're dealing right now with those that are not. These individuals were living according to those ways. Turn over to Colossians, the second chapter, in verse 8. <clears throat> and here Paul uses this term tradition for us. And he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The tradition of men that he's talking about here, that 
philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, is probably, uh, from all that we can determine, an early form of Gnosticism. Now then, we could spend an entire lesson, probably more than that, dealing with the, just the subject of Gnosticism. But on a very basic uh, ideas of Gnosticism is what was referred to as dualism. Good and evil, and the two cannot mix in any way. And thus, you had that which was good. Well, what was good? God, spirit. You had evil, this world, the physical. There's no way that these two can mix. Now, it had implications in relationship to Christ. They also had implications in relationship to the creation of the world. They uh, taught, one uh, form at least, that there were emanations, as they referred to them, from God, each a little bit less God and a little bit more physical, until you get down to a certain point which they called the demiurge. And this demiurge had enough God in him that he could create, but enough evil in him that he could handle the world or create the material. And so the demiurge is what created this world. Well, that was in relationship to creation. In relationship to Jesus, well, what did God affirm of Jesus? He's the Son of God. But in the Gnostic mind, you can't have that. You can't have God in flesh because God is good and flesh is evil. Now, if that's the case, then how do you explain Jesus and his deity? Well, you, do, you explain that he wasn't really deity. Or, and there's different aspects of this, one was seemism, that Jesus didn't really have a physical body. The docetics were Gnostics. And do, it comes from dokio, which means seem or appears. And so he only seemed to be. He didn't really exist. Didn't have physical, any physical nature. And thus he could be God, but he didn't have a physical body. He only appeared. He was kind of a ghostly apparition. Another form said that you had the man Jesus born into this world... And at his baptism, the spirit came in to his physical body so that it was no longer physical and it was just spiritual and you had the spirit Christ inhabit that body until the time of Christ's death. And then, of course, when you remember the Jesus saying on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In the Gnostic viewpoint, he's saying that that spirit left his body, spirit Christ left his body, so that now then it was only the physical man, Jesus, then. And in that, you have to make a distinction between Jesus and Christ. Jesus was the physical, Christ was the spiritual. Now, yeah, it's sort of confusing, isn't it? <laughs> And then others just denied that Jesus was God altogether. Really, that becomes the background of the book of books of first, second, and third John. It also is the background of the gospel account of John. All of his writings are dealing directly with this false doctrine of Gnosticism. There were two from an ethical standpoint in relationship to ethics. How do ethics come into this? Uh, you have two extremes, really. One extreme is, since the body is evil, go ahead and let the body do whatever it wants to, because the spirit's going to be good anyway. And so the body can engage in all forms of evil and sin and wickedness, and the person is still good because he's spirit. The other form said, since the body is evil, you have to punish the body. 
And so you had the asceticism that took place in which they physically punished the body, the physical body. Why? Because any desire of the physical had to be suppressed. The Roman Catholic nuns and the priesthood came out of asceticism. Those physical desires were evil. They were sinful. Why? Because all things physical or sinful, only spirit is good. The philosophy that Paul talks about here in Colossians 2 and verse 8, the vain deceit, the tradition of men, is probably an early form of this Gnosticism. But look at the word spoil as well. Zodhidus, uh, in defining this word, the Greek word that's translated spoil, says it means, from a figurative standpoint, of destructive effects of false teachers who rob believers of the complete riches available in Christ and revealed in the gospel. Now that's a good definition. False teachers who rob believers of the complete riches that are available in Christ and revealed in the gospel. It goes back to the idea of false teachers, though. And so Paul is saying, you beware of, and we can just substitute here, false teachers. In all of the forms that they take, you beware of false teachers. Because those false teachers are going to rob you of the riches that you have available in Christ. All of the blessings that are in Christ, false teachers are going to rob you of those blessings. Remember all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, are in Christ, in the church, or in heavenly places. And heavenly places deals with and has reference to the church. Thus, all spiritual blessings. Where are they? They're in Christ. Where? In the church. When you have false teachers come in, they rob you of those blessings. You no longer have those spiritual blessings. You no longer have the peace of God. You no ha longer have the joy that's found in Christ. You no longer have that purpose of life that God gives. You no longer have the hope of an eternity with God in heaven. You no longer have that opportunity to go to God in prayer through Jesus Christ. Why? Because false teachers have robbed you of those blessings. That's the idea of spoil here. And again, he's dealing with false teachers. Specifically for them at that time that Paul is dealing with Probably in that early form of Gnosticism in all of the aspects that it's going to take on. These individuals who, and the word Gnostic comes from the idea or from the word Gnosis, which means knowledge. They claim to have a special knowledge that other Christians didn't possess. Remember we talked about the arrogance of those who claim to be born-again Christians? Well, these individuals were Gnostics in the same idea. They had a special revelation from God that other people didn't possess. So you couldn't tell them anything because they were in the know and you weren't. All of the false doctrines that come from it Paul says they're going to destroy the blessings they have in Christ so that you no longer have and possess those blessings. When we look at false doctrine today, we are, our society, our world is inundated with false doctrine. You could look at the world religions. Islam is making tremendous strides in the United States today. 
It is the fastest growing religion in the United States. And generally, we who are members of the church, if you ask, what do you know about Islam? Well, as far as a religion, you don't know anything. They're just those radicals who strap a bomb to themselves and come over and blow up by up. What do you know about their doctrine? Their teaching? Oh, they follow uh, Muhammad. What do you know about the teaching of it, though? How are we going to reach those individuals if we can't even relate to them? Aren't we to preach the gospel to every creature? Oh, but that's except Muslims, right? No. But it's a false doctrine. Judaism today. Now, yes, there was the Judaism of the Old Testament that was a valid, true religion that God has, had authorized, but today it's not. They, there is absolutely no way that those who are Jews can, today can practice what God taught in the Old Testament for Jews to do. God made it impossible through his providential means by sending Titus and the Roman armies to destroy the city of Jerusalem in AD 70, which destroyed all of the genealogical records, and without the genealogical records, you can have absolutely no Jewish religion. Why? Because the Jewish religion had to have the Levitical priesthood. And to be a Levitical priest, yeah, high priest, all of the priesthood, had to go back to the genealogical records to prove that they were from Aaron. Can't do it. If you can't do it, then you can't have the religion. But yet it's flourishing today. Buddhism. Maybe not, and Hinduism, maybe not in our society so much, but in other areas of the world, it's still growing. And it's still a problem. Then we're faced with more in our society, and that we're familiar with, the denominations that are all around us. Let's face it, Catholicism is still huge in the United States. A lot of them claim to be Catholics, even though they're not really practicing Catholics. And any time you hear about the Pope, why, he's the head of the church, isn't he? Just listen to the news reports. Listen to the radio. Listen to the talk people. They all refer to him. Here's the head of the church. Well, no, he's the head of the Roman Catholic Church. I'll admit that. But he's sure not head of the church. Not the one that we read about in the Bible. Not the only one that Jesus Christ established. False doctrine. And all of the false doctrine that comes from papacy. You have Mormonism. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Methodism, and we can just go on and on. The Southern Baptists, the and you know, there's over a thousand different religions today that all claim to be of Christ, and all of them are wrong, except for one, and that's the Lord's Church, the churches of Christ. But the thing is that each one of these thousand plus religions are all teaching a little bit different doctrine. They believe different things. They teach different things. What are they teaching? They're teaching false doctrine that spoil men, that rob men of the blessings that are, would be found or that are available in Christ. And when they teach, oh, you're saved by faith only. They give hope to people, but it's a false hope. Why? Because they're teaching false doctrine. And false doctrine will not save. It only spoils men. It does not save men. 
Then we have all sorts of in the denominations uh, isms that we could talk about. You have premillennialism running rampant. Just about all religious groups believe in some form of premillennialism today. It's interesting if you go back historically within religious groups, premillennialism is a relatively new doctrine that has been accepted by religious groups. You go back a couple of centuries, and premillennialism basically was not known. It was popularized really in the 1900s. But the idea that Christ is not king now, he's not ruling on his throne, he's going to come back because the Jews rejected him the first time, he's got to come back the second time, and at the second coming he's going to restore or he's going to build his kingdom in the city of Jerusalem and rule in the city of Jerusalem for a thousand years. Where's that in the Bible? Uh, we hear so much about, well, are you ready for the rapture? God's going to rapture the saints away. Where is that in the Bible? It's not found. But it's within this system of premillennialism. False doctrines, isms. Calvinism, which is really warmed over Augustinianism. And it's tulip, and hopefully you're reading the bulletin, and you know about the tulip. And you know the errors of the tulip and what each one of the letters of the tulip stands for. If you don't, the T stands for total depravity. A man is totally depraved. He's totally evil. Now where did that come from? That came from the Gnostic viewpoint. The Gnostic said... All matter is evil. Man is made up of matter. Thus, what is man? Man's evil. What does Calvinism teach? That man is totally depraved. He can do nothing good. That's the T, the U, unconditional election. Or what we generally refer to as Calvinistic predestination. It says that even before the world began, God determined that here's, for example, Michael Hatcher going to be born in 1900, none of your business, and he's going to be saved. Or he's going to be lost. And Michael Hatcher over here, who's born at that time, I might want to be saved. But if God determined he's going to be lost... Doesn't matter, I'm going to be lost. Doesn't matter if I want to be saved. Doesn't matter if I want to do what's right. Doesn't matter if I want to obey God. I'm lost, I'm going to hell, and there's nothing I can do about it. Now, and someone else over here who's going to, who God had determined to save, well, he's going to be saved. But what if he doesn't uh, want to do what's right? What if he wants to do evil? Doesn't matter, he's going to be saved anyway. Unconditional election. The L stands for limited atonement. Because why in the world would Christ die for someone that God had already determined to send to hell? You talk about wasting the blood of Christ? That certainly would be wasting Christ's blood. Why in the world would he die for someone who has absolutely no chance and no opportunity to go to heaven? God had already determined and there's nothing that that individual can do. He's going to hell no matter what. Now, why would Christ die for him? And so Christ didn't die for those individuals. Christ only died for the elect, those who God had determined beforehand to save. That's the L. You have the I. It has reference to irresistible grace. God determined to save this individual here, so what does he have to do? Well, that individual is totally evil, he can't obey God. He can't do anything that pleases God. So what happens? God has to send the Holy Spirit into his heart. And the Holy Spirit then makes him realize, oh, I'm a sinner. Convicts him of his sin. And the Holy Spirit then converts him. That's why it's by grace only. Salvation by grace only is Calvinistic doctrine because of the doctrine of irresistible grace. 
And the Holy Spirit not only convicts him of his sin, converts him to Christ, the Holy Spirit then makes sure that he's going to be saved. And there you have the perseverance of the saints, or the, the P in tulip, perseverance of the saints. Once saved, always saved. Why? Because God sent the Holy Spirit into his heart and the Holy Spirit is making sure that he's going to be saved. Yeah, and he has no choice in the matter. Well, that's Calvinism. Warmed over Augustinianism that goes back to the 300s. And yet permeating the religious world today. Coming out of that, to a great extent at least, is the idea of Pentecostalism that we see. Let's face it, so many individuals today, they see Pentecostalism as religion. Why? Because you have to have that excitement and that joy. I mean, you've got to get the Holy Spirit in you and you have to jump around and make all, get all excited and everything. That that's religion. Where did that come from? It came from Calvinism that God sent the Holy Spirit into that individual's life. If the Holy Spirit's there, then what's going to happen? Well, he's, going, he's got the Spirit. He can then perform miracles. All of these things robbing men of the blessings of Christianity. Then you can get into specific doctrines. You can get into doctrines regarding God and the nature of God. And deal with that, you can get, have the subsets of the doctrine of Jesus. And Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, teaching that Jesus was not God. He was a created being. He might be a God. You have Mormonism over here teaching that man becomes God. And that God is just really in all effect, God is a glorified man. That's all he is. And then doctrines of the Holy Spirit, well, those things abound uh, to such an extent it becomes ridiculous. You have false doctrines regarding salvation. What God has set forth in relationship for man to do to be saved. That, yes, there is God's aspect of salvation. That we are saved by grace. We're not saved by grace only, but we have to have the grace of God in order to be saved. But there's also man's aspect. Man has to do certain things. Man has to believe. Man has to repent of his sins. Remember what we said from 1 Corinthians 11, or the 6th chapter? That here they were, they were following the traditions of man that were not authorized by God, but such were some of you. What did they do? They had to repent. They had to turn away from those traditions of men that were unauthorized to turn to live for God. Man has to repent. Man has to make a confession of his faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins. But guess what? Every one of those things have been perverted by man. And there's false doctrines dealing with every aspect of man's, salva man's responsibility in regards to his salvation. When we get to the church, and again, false doctrine abounds regarding the church and what it is. Its uniqueness. In other words, there's only one church, according to the Bible, but not according to man. They even just join the church of your choice. Why? Because we're all going to the same place, just in different ways. And so whatever pleases you, remember, it's not what pleases God, it's what pleases man that's important to man today. And we have to get man away from that, that it's not what pleases you, it's what God desires. What does God want? There's only one church that Jesus Christ built and he's established that he's going to save. When we get with the worship of the church, and again, we see singing 
God authorized us to sing. And yet religious groups bring in the instruments of music and we're seeing that even in the Lord's church. But now then we're also seeing the clapping of hands, rhythmic clapping to go along with it or the snapping of the fingers or other aspects, making our voices sound like instruments of music. Those things are not singing. Man has perverted false doctrine, what God says in relationship to singing. In prayers, again, man has perverted the aspect of prayers, that they are to be directed to the Father. But now then we're hearing, oh, you can direct your prayers to Jesus, you can pray, direct your prayers to Holy Spirit. That's being taught in the church of our Lord today. We hadn't gotten to the point of some religious groups that you can pray to Mary or you can pray to a departed saint or to others. At least not that I know of. But it will come. The Lord's Supper, well, you can take it any day of the week, right? So uh, says many within the Lord's church today where God only authorized it upon the first day of the week. And how often does that come? Well, guess what? It comes every week. That doesn't take a genius to figure that out, does it? But the religious world said, oh, you didn't uh, take it that often. Just say it every quarter or every year or, you know, on these special occasions. And then we start saying, well, special occasions like a wedding, we can take it then as well. Or some other special occasion. And thus those things work their way into the church. And now then we have those in the church teaching false doctrine relating to the Lord's Supper. False doctrine relating to giving. And how we obtain our funds. And so all of the aspects of the worship of the church... There's false teachings relating to them. What about the organization of the church? Look at the denominational world. You don't see a biblical organization of the church. That Jesus Christ is the head of the church, but within the local congregation, he established elders who oversee the work of the church, deacons who are special servants in relationship to the work that is to go on. What do you have? You have one man rule, pastor system, and sadly, we have that even within the Lord's church. We have the undermining of the authority of elders. The elders don't have any authority in the local congregation. And a few years ago, even amongst those who were considered sound, you had the idea of, well, if we don't like the elders, we'll just vote them out. With the reaffirmation and re-evaluation, uh, reaffirmation of elders. All of these things, the work of the church, the morals that God has set forth, all of these things are under attack with false doctrines, false teachings that will spoil man through those philosophies and vain teachings, those traditions of man. And sadly... Those traditions from false religions, those traditions of the world, given time, those traditions soon make their way into the Lord's church. I don't care just about any doctrine you can come up with, it's being, going to be taught in the church. Oh, surely not. Yes, it is. Well, surely we wouldn't think about homosexuals. Yes, there's homosexual churches of Christ. Doesn't matter what the false doctrine is, it will soon or eventually make its way into the Lord's church. And so what is it? We have to, as Jude puts it in Jude verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. 
our obligation, earnestly contend for the faith. Why? Because it's the faith which will provide us the blessings of Christianity. But false doctrine will rob us of those blessings. And so we must ever be on guard. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Why? Because people are going to bring in damnable heresies. Look at what Peter wrote in the first three verses of 2 Peter 2. When he says, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, that is privately, they do it secretly, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. False religions false traditions of men that God has not authorized will bring us into the bondage of sin and cause an eternal separation from God and thus we must ever be on guard because false doctrine and false teaching is all around us even in the church of our Lord and if we're not on guard we will be swept up by the evils of those false doctrines and the traditions of men and not follow the tradition of God. Now, if you've not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ this evening, we would plead with you to do what God says. Follow His traditions, not the traditions of man, what man might come up with and what man might preach and teach. Follow the traditions of God, the ordinances, the laws that God has set forth within His, his Bible. And... We already went over what it takes to be saved. And if you haven't done those things, do that this evening. If you have obeyed that truth, but you haven't continued to live the life that God wants you to live, haven't been that holy and sanctified and justified one, then why not this evening repent of your sins and accept the forgiveness that God has to offer through the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son. Now, if you need to come, do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.